You just gave me a new idea for the McHenry deal. Instead of D.C. statehood, maybe just a line item for funding Jack Smith. You know, just ensuring <laughs> Jack, Jack Smith's funding for one more year. That, that's, that'd do it for me. Hello, welcome to the Bulwark's uh, Next Level Sunday interview. I'm Tim Miller. I'm here with Congressman Dan Goldman, who's got not much to do, I wouldn't say. What do you do today? Uh, did you have a spa day? Sitting to take a well, long, yeah. warm bath? You sit around uh, waiting for the Republicans to try to sort out their own civil war. Um, yeah. So definitely a lot of uh, waiting around. I'm surprised you put on a jacket for me. I don't know. If I was in your guys' shoes, I'd just be, I'd just be chilling. Uh, well, I because... did take off my tie. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, I, so we're, at, we're taping this on Thursday afternoon, um, so for fo- to put folks in a place. And I, I wanted to talk about Israel and Sidney Powell and the other news, but I feel like we should start here. Uh, they were flirting today with the idea of uh, giving kind of a temporary quasi speakership to Patrick McHenry, um, the, fell in the little chair. Uh, it seems like that does, has not, uh, does not have support from within the conference. So they might go back and go after Jim Jordan again. Like what, what's your sense of the, of the state of play over there in crazy town? Well, I, I wish I had some way of, uh, looking into their minds, but it's not, doesn't seem to be rational and doesn't seem to be logical. Um, And I think what is clear is that uh, the only way out of this immediate uh, difficulty that they're having is to give Patrick McHenry some temporary powers so that Congress can reopen and we can do the job that we were sent here to do. And there's a lot of bipartisan legislation that's waiting uh, to be passed. Uh, There is overwhelming support uh, for not only security money for Israel, but also Ukraine. Um, also, we need to fund the government past November 17th. We need to do a, a number of other priorities before the end of the year. The FAA reauthorization, the farm bill. Um, there are must pass. There's much pass legislation that has bipartisan support. So what we need is a mechanism to get bipartisan legislation on the House floor so we can pass it. And elevating Patrick McHenry um, in a temporary role is seems to be the only way to do it because it is apparent that no Republican can get 217 votes for speaker. Yeah. I don't know if he wants it. I don't know if he wants that job. I mean, I guess the only thing I worry about about that is that, you know, you guys, uh, obviously we have important stuff to do and it's important that we have one party that actually cares about governing, but, um, you know, you got to cut a deal with them, right. That, that, that actually, yield ensures that you can vote on some of the stuff, not just Ukraine, but maybe some other things that, that the MAGA side of the caucus doesn't want. Right. And, and so, uh, you know, what is your guys sense for like what the asks are on that? If there's a well, temporary look, speaker, we, we are really uh, intent on being a good faith partner in a bipartisan path forward. And we are not looking to extract major concessions uh, from the Republicans to reorganize and reorient the rules and the entire structure of the House. Uh, So our asks are very reasonable and they are simply um, to pursue the bipartisan agreements that we have already, um, which is essential for Congress to do its work. Um, One of the frustrating things that uh, we Democrats felt during the Kevin McCarthy brief era is that there was a there's a lot of legislation that has overwhelming support of the majority, vast majority of the House. But because he was held hostage by the extreme right, he refused to bring a lot of that to the floor. Ukraine aid is a perfect example. There are well over 300 members who would support aid, more aid for Ukraine. But he was not bringing it to the floor because he had his extreme right wing uh, threatened to remove him if he did. He ended up getting removed. But we cannot uh, live in a world where a few extremists are guiding the uh, controlling the House of Representatives. This is why you guys are better people than me. You know, I was saying, I don't know, maybe D.C. statehood or something in exchange for Patrick McHenry. I don't know. Let's start. Let's start making some real ass. But I think that's fair. The bipartisan bills making sure they get a chance to pass the problem that they have to your point is on the one hand it's an extreme few that really precipitated this right on the other hand 
I, the stuff you're talking about that's 300 votes, it's actually like 212 Democrats and 80 Republicans, right? right. And it's so like, that's the problem. That's like the that main problem. To be, that. that appears to be the hang up right now yeah. is um, there there is not uh, a majority of the Republican Party that wants to go this route right. um, in supporting uh, Patrick McHenry's temporary elevation to acting speaker, speaker pro tem. And that's causing, I think, consternation within uh, the the Republican, the reasonable traditional Republicans who want to pursue this because uh, they recognize that, A, it's the only way out and B, it's the only way that we're going to get the work done we need to get done. And so that's the hang up right now. Jim Jordan is going to lose votes if he goes back on the floor. Anyone else will not get 217 votes. This seems to be the only path forward, but they are hanging themselves up because they don't seem to acknowledge that. Yeah. Well, just this is probably a fantasy, but we're on the Never Trumper podcast. Okay. So just dream with me for a second. Doesn't Don Bacon want a portrait? You know, yeah. can't we? Fi- can't you find one of those guys? Don't one of those like? Don't we have somebody whose ego we could tickle? You know, maybe. Well, as, as you know all too well, Tim. I mean, part of the the trick with crossing over party lines to support uh, a speaker from another side is you effectively have to join that party. Right. So if Don Bacon and a few others. Um, decide to try to get Democratic support to become the Speaker of the House, they may be able to be Speaker, but they will be persona non grata in the Republican Party, and it will be very difficult to uh, accomplish anything under those circumstances. It will. It just, you know, it depends on how long this goes. It might might be tempting. If you if you just run into Don in the cloakroom, just say, Speaker Bacon. It sounds <laughs> nice, doesn't it? You just had to recruit three other guys or, or gals and we can make it happen. You know, it's uh, uh, certainly uh, we Democrats are open to anything <laughs> that would get this house back open. But as as you know, it takes two to tango. Um, and so we need to have a partner on the other side. We are in the minority. We cannot do anything without... Uh, at least some members of the Republican majority. So we we are in a, a holding pattern, uh, eager to work in a bipartisan way. But uh, we ca- bipartisan requires two, not not one. Yeah. Okay. Just the last thing on this. I mean, it is it's pretty insane. And I and I really I'll be you know this is, will air in a couple of days, so I might, I might prove to be wrong. But to me, it seems like there's not really an end in sight. Like if it wasn't Jordan. I just I think the McHenry thing's hard for them to put together because there's going to be so much anger about it on the right, and and so you sit here doing nothing when we have all these crises. Like, I, what is your thought about how Democrats can best explain that to folks that don't follow, you know, Punchbowl DC and like aren't following the day to day of this? How can you message about about the contrast here? Well, I think what we've been saying is uh, what exactly where we are. And I think it's the message that resonates uh, based on polling that we've seen this week. Um, the Republican approval rating is uh, has gone down dramatically just in the last 30 days, the Republican Congress approval rating. Um, there are uh, swing districts polls that show that the vast majority of people want to see a bipartisan solution in the House. And the Democrats, uh, we have been very open and very eager in public and with our Republican colleagues to work in a bipartisan way so that we can actually get something done. We are not trying to uh, use this for as much political gain as we can. And by the way, we could because uh, this is politically disastrous for the Republicans but that's not what our priority is. We, as you know, Leader Jeffrey says all the time, we are putting people over politics. And to put people over politics means that you actually have to do the work that the people want and that will benefit the people. And um, that is the message that we are conveying because that is what we believe. Um, well, I, I think that's well intentioned, appreciated. I don't, you know, part of me just wonders if they have to have a, we have to run into this shutdown again and, and have people, some, you know, folks actually see it. Um, and, and I think that that seems more realistic than it might have a few days ago. We'll, we'll see how it turns out. Um, well, I will say, I mean, uh, if this supplemental uh, security bill with uh, Israel aid, Ukraine aid, 
Taiwan aid, uh, maybe, you know, border some, wasn't their border on there too. And maybe with the border security, which Republicans uh, and, and Democrats want alike. Um, and, and that passes the Senate and it comes over and it's sitting in the house and we can't do anything about it, even though, you know, the, the super majority of the house would want, would support the bill and would pass it. Uh, that's going to be very difficult for them to maintain and explain. Indeed. Um, okay. Well, I we had um, I'd originally reached out um, uh, to chat uh, for this because of what was happening in Israel, obviously, and so uh, you know we had to cover the speaker craziness first. Uh, I want to get to Sydney Powell, but for folks who don't know, um, you were with your family in Tel Aviv uh, last last weekend. Now, I guess um, it was uh, when uh, the original terrorist attack happened. So, you know, for folks that aren't aware, just kind of briefly sort of walk through uh, why you were over there with your kids and and what that was like. Yeah, we had a a family bar mitzvah in Israel. I actually missed the first uh, whole weekend and most of the bar mitzvah because of the shutdown. And then we were kept in D.C. before Speaker McCarthy uh, was removed. Uh, And after that, I I quickly went and tried to join my did join my family in Tel Aviv. And um, we were awoken on Saturday morning, October 7th at 630 with uh, sirens uh, indicating that rockets were heading our way from uh, Hamas in the Gaza Strip. And we're told that we had 90 seconds to get to the interior stairwell to seek shelter before those rockets might arrive. Uh, So I gathered my three kids and my wife and we ran to the stairwell and and it was scary. And and it was scary for us going back and forth as we needed to do uh, throughout the morning and then again in the evening. Uh, But it was really traumatic for my kids who could not understand uh, what was going on. How old are your kids? Nine, six and five were the three that were with us and, you know, different ages. But these are these are difficult things to explain to kids that age. And the unfortunate reality is, of course, Israeli children grow up like this. Um, so these were things we would, of course, like to have waited to explain to our kids. And they're still dealing with some of the trauma. Of course, uh, there's no comparison to sure. the horrific, horrific trauma and awful um, atrocities that occurred in the South. And that just, uh, eats at me every day. Yeah. Um, obviously there's no comparison, but you know, you're a dad. So just like, how, how are they doing? Or, I mean, I assume they're still, you all are still talking about it as a family. Yeah. We're, they're, they're doing better and they are talking about it. Um, you know, that first week back was tricky. My, you know, my daughter woke up in the middle of the night, uh, worried it was going to be World War Three, And, you know, my son kept asking which team was winning, um, you know, it just and, and was, you know, went to sleep on the floor in school one day. So it has definitely had an impact, but we are continuing to talk about it and we're going to get them some help, some professional help just to make sure that this doesn't uh, stay with them uh indefinitely yes Todd, that's why i was an imprint we had a bullet come through the door to our house my daughter's five now about a year and a half ago and it's just like how do you can't explain it to them right like you can't really give them the context of what's happening but like the memory of that like of the seeing the bullet or being in the stairwell right it's like that that sticks with them that you know you can see it churning in their little heads so anyway i'm glad that um that you guys are, are talking it through so uh, you guys were able to get out i guess the next day and but now there's still folks over there and uh, and that that's something that you're trying to work on yeah i mean the first and and obvious uh, biggest priority is the hostages um, right. many of whom are american who remain in gaza um, the Hamas has not uh, given any information to anyone about them. They're not allowing the International Red Cross to even come in, which is required by the Geneva Conventions. And um, everyone has no idea what's going on with them. And there are babies without their parents who are there. There's an 85-year-old Holocaust survivor who requires medicine every day. Um, and no one has any idea what is going on or how, what condition they're in. And this is a terrorist group who has captured and is keeping hostages and we need to remember that there are many americans uh, in gaza in um also in uh, of course in israel 
um, who are trying to get home. Uh, there are a lot in my district, which is a very heavily Jewish district, and it was the holiday of Sukkot when many Jews go to Israel. So there was a disproportionate number of of uh, Jews, uh, especially from my district, who were there. And we've been working around the clock just to make sure that we can uh, document, track, and trace everybody who is over there and needs help and working with the State Department. Uh, many of them have been able to return home, and there are still some over there that we're continuing to uh, to work on. Yeah, it does seem like uh, DeSantis was going off on this for a little while about how, you know, you got to go on a boat to Cyprus or whatever. And they, they'd sent a, a plane from Florida over there. Uh, you know what? Like why? It, it does feel like this should be something that like the federal government should be able to get figured out. I, the hostage situation, let's put that aside for a second, because that's a, a, a whole different bag of worms. But just well, you that's know, part other of folks. the reason that I, um, along with uh, my fellow New York delegation members, uh, Congressman Espaillat and Congressman Velasquez, introduced the Safe Return Act, which it would do exactly what you're saying. It's not only that it's complicated to get out, uh, it's that the people trying to get out must reimburse the State Department for how much what they spend um, on getting them out, um, which is pretty absurd when you're in the middle of a war zone. Um, yeah. And so we have um, uh, introduced this bill that would uh, allow require the State Department to pay for any transportation when the State Department needs to intervene in a conflict zone and get American citizens out, because exactly as you're saying, uh, it should not be that complicated and it should not be an additional financial burden on people who are uh, in jeopardy of their lives. Uh, so President Biden is over in Israel and was meeting with Bibi's given remarks, um, several, I think, very stirring remarks in, in my view, um, both about the alliance with Israel, but also, yeah, you know, I think just a slight caution about maybe overzealousness and, and the rage and anger and letting that consume, you know, the the strategic decisions that need to be made about a response to this, such a just a horrific inhuman attack. And so I'm just uh, I'm wondering how you assess how the administration's been doing. And also, you know, obviously you're over there and you have communication with folks in Israel, you know, how, uh, you know, how, how they're feeling about about President Biden's reaction. Well, first and foremost, um, I have been so uh, impressed and proud of the leadership and the response that President Biden has exhibited over the last two weeks. Um, I think he has hit the exact right note um, because this is not only a horrific terrorist organization that executed these awful attacks, um, but this is they did so against a, the lone democracy in that region and our strong democratic ally uh, that must be able to defend itself and we must support them in doing so against a terrorist organization. Um, I think President Biden's leadership, both just in terms of uh, his stirring and powerful rhetoric, uh, as well as the decisions to move some of our military into the eastern Mediterranean. A couple strike carrier strike forces are now over there as a deterrent to prevent this from escalating any further and really intensive diplomatic work. Uh, with everyone in the region, Israel, Egypt, but beyond, um, and certainly uh, throughout the Middle East, to try to make sure this does not uh, escalate beyond Israel and uh, the Gaza Strip, um, and that no other countries or terrorist organizations gets involved. I think that's been incredibly important. It's also really important to make sure we recognize that Hamas is the enemy. Hamas is the terrorist network that executed these attacks. Hamas is not the Palestinian people. And uh, one of the things I think the president has correctly emphasized is that we all need to do everything we can to protect, protect innocent Palestinian civilians. Um, Israel has been doing that by sending warnings about their pending attacks, by urging them to evacuate to the south. And with President Biden's urging, uh, both Israel and Egypt agreed to provide humanitarian relief to the Palestinians in the uh, who have uh, who are effectively refugees now in their in their own territory, um, and that's an essential part of uh, of this balance because Hamas uses the innocent civilians as human shields, and that is something that 
um, I think is little known, but is really important. They have discouraged Palestinian civilians from uh, evacuating and they put their terror networks and their command centers and their weapons uh, within residential neighborhoods, even schools and under hospitals. Um, and that's an effort to use the innocent civilians as human shields. So it's a, a very difficult situation, um, but I think President Biden's support of Israel's right and obligation to defend itself uh, by the, of the need to eliminate and eradicate Hamas which will ultimately be better for the Palestinian people as well as the Israeli people and making sure that we are doing everything we can to protect innocent civilians. Um, I, I want to just do a couple of the maybe uh, well, critiques, maybe it's not the right word from the, that are coming from the left um, and, and just, you know, sort of see where you're at on that. I, the first one I, I have a little bit, you know, more sympathy towards, uh, you know, I, obviously there is a need and, and, you know, those of us, of course, the Bulwark and elsewhere have been very much of the view that rhetorically and diplomatically, we need to understand that we need to be with our ally Israel. And, and I think President Biden's done a good job with that. Eventually, though, this moves into more of a military operation and, and our partner and ally there in BB, I, you know, who knows exactly what what kind of the next strategic approach is going to be. And I think there's maybe some concerns about, uh, you know, doing a uh, invasion, a ground invasion without a real plan. Like what, what is your sense for that? And like, when you're talking to folks in the administration, balancing, like being supportive of Israel and not, you know, getting sucked into a quagmire. Well, look, I, I think, um, just looking at what has happened over the last week, it was last Friday that Israel gave a 24 hour warning for a million people, uh, in the Northern part of Gaza to evacuate to the South. Um, that obviously was not going to happen within 24 hours, but nothing has happened for almost a week now. And I think that's a reflection of ongoing dialogue about uh, the best way to handle this. But let's not forget, every single day that we do not recover the hostages in Gaza, it is less likely that we will be able to recover them safely. And that has to be a priority and time is of the essence. So I, I wouldn't expect President Biden to micromanage uh, is the Israeli military. Um, I think he has been uh, in had really important and uh, meaningful conversations with Prime Minister Netanyahu. And so far, I think Israel has um, shown uh, compassion for the Palestinian civilians um, while also focusing on the task at hand, which is to eliminate Hamas and to get those hostages home. Is there any, like, you know, where are you at as far as views on, like, hope for getting these hostages? I, like you said, I do think this that is the prime issue right now. And, and it feels very uh, daunting, almost feels like an understatement. Like, what, what's your sense for like that process? Yeah, I, I agree with you. And the longer it goes and we don't hear anything, uh, the more fearful I get. The one, uh, I guess, hope is that I am pretty sure that Hamas took at least uh, a number of the hostages because they want to have something to swap in return for Hamas or uh, Palestinian prisoners. Yeah. Um, and so there is an incentive for them to keep uh, hostages safe and alive. Um, and then we can deal with that on, on the back end. But, you know, with with a, an organization that committed the subhuman horrific attacks on uh, innocent lives by burning people alive, uh, reports are that 80 percent of those who were killed were tortured. Uh, raping people, just unspeakably awful, awful things. It's, you know, the, it's, it's, you hate to imagine what, uh, what might the, uh, the hostages yeah. be going through. This last thing on the hostages, doesn't that, um, that also becomes a bit of a tough call on what to do, right? You know, because Israel in the past has been willing to deal with them on this, on hostages. And, uh, you know, it was um, the IDF hostage trade um that happened in the past one of the uh hostages that was released back was one of the organizers of this reportedly right um and so you know I, 
I, you get into this situation where I, I think that there's a lot of rhetoric that comes from a concerning rhetoric that comes from the left about absolutism on this. When, when the que- question is about how to handle, you know, Hamas, when you're, when you're dealing with somebody that is not playing by the laws of war, that you can, that is not a reliable partner. You know, how, I, how, how do you think what it is the right way to kind of na- to balance that? Well, look, I think we need to remember right now um, as Americans that a terrorist organization is holding uh, approximately a dozen American citizens as hostages. And if Al Qaeda were doing that, if ISIS were doing that, uh, you can bet that our military would be right there involved. And, and I frankly don't think that we um, you know, should leave this up to the Israelis alone. And I think that uh, it needs to be uh, a very aggressive, wholesome and fulsome approach to getting these hostages back. And the reality is um, it's going to be dangerous and it's going to be difficult, but it's very hard to get hostages back if uh, you're not on the ground. And airstrikes, you know, can uh, can certainly devastate infrastructure and command centers and weapons, uh, but they also run the risk of actually hitting hostages. So that is why I think it is ultimately going to be imperative uh, that there is a ground invasion uh, in an effort to get the hostages back. Well, I appreciate how stalwart you are on this. Obviously, this is, uh, um, you know, where many of us uh, are here at the Bulwark. I, you know, I, we did the whole episode last week on this. So I just want to ask one question. But how, like, how concerned are you about, you know, you, the views that you're expressing there, uh, to say the least, are not uh, maybe the majority view on campus these days? Um, you know, a lot of younger folks, particularly on the left, have... Um, been critical of Biden, critical of Democrats, critical of Israel for the response. Have you been a few members of your uh, of your caucus um, that uh, have been critical? I think Rashida Tlaib has been more critical of Biden than she has been of Hamas, uh, by my account, um, so far. So how do you like are you concerned at all about that fracture? Um, and, and how do you how do you see those questions coming from the left? Well, I, I'm concerned as much about sort of the Uh, misunderstanding that appears to exist about what is going on. Um, This is not a continuation of the cycle of violence between Israelis and Palestinians, you know, that we've unfortunately become accustomed to. Gaza is not the West Bank where the Palestinian Authority controls it. Uh, Their security services often work with Israelis. They have recognized Israel and its right to exist. Hamas is in total control in Gaza, and it's a terrorist organization, and it executed one of the worst terrorist attacks ever. So this is entirely separate, um, really, from the the conflict that it seems like a lot of people on the left are lumping this in with. And what I hope people will recognize, and I doubt that many are listening here uh, from the left, but from the far left. But I, I do hope that they will recognize that, you know, this is not a war between Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, this is a war between Israel and a terrorist organization, Hamas, that is obviously um, un, unworkable as a peace partner with Israel, but is also very detrimental to the Palestinian people. Hamas has received billions of dollars uh, from Qatar and uh, through uh, other sources over the last 15 years. And the majority of that, I would guess, a certain significant amount of it has been uh, repurposed for their own terror network and their own uh, military activities, their own violence. Um, And it was intended always for the Palestinian people, but they did not invest in schools or roads or infrastructure or uh, the economy. And so part of the reason why the Palestinians are in such uh, terrible shape in in Gaza is because of Hamas and that they're they're terrible for them. So the pathway to peace has to include eliminating Hamas. And I am optimistic that once this is over and Hamas is removed and defeated, that we can figure out in conjunction with allies all around the world, from the Arab world, from Europe, um, the United States, Israel, 
that we can figure out a pathway where there can be a government uh, that is will recognize Israel's right to exist, unlike Hamas, and will be a good faith partner in peace that can oversee the Gaza Strip. A Palestinian government? I think it would may have to be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I certainly I think that we're going to need, you know, a uh, variety of uh, Arab countries to be involved in the process of rebuilding Gaza. A, a different version in some ways of the Marshall Plan is, I think, the way that this is we're going to have to look at this and it's going to have to be a collaboration among many different countries with an effort to uh, acknowledge Israel's right to exist uh, and within its borders and to figure out a way of whether it's the Palestinian Authority or uh, some other government to uh, lead the way in, in Gaza. When you're talking about the Arab partners, where were you on? Uh, obviously, this is, I'm sure, I've been waylaid now given events. But like, where were you on the talks between the Biden administration and the Saudis on you know, kind of expanding the Abraham Accords, if you will? Well, I'm I'm broadly very supportive of it. Obviously, we would need to understand, I would need to understand the details. Um, But I think the Abraham Accords were a great step forward and normalization with Saudi Arabia would be an even bigger step forward for Israel. And I also think it would be a path forward toward peace, because I would imagine that once Saudi Arabia normalizes relationships with Israel, recognizes the state of Israel, uh, that it will have a much more vested interest in the Israeli-Palestinian relationship and can yeah. be of great assistance in helping to facilitate a, a peaceful pathway in the Middle East. I'm a little skeptical about that. We can for another day. We can we can we can de- we can delay that. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not. Sh- I'm not so sure that's the case. But um, I don't. I also just don't know that there's a good answer. Um, so I think it, I think it's as good answer as any. Let's 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 go into a little more amusing, equally serious but more amusing territory. Um, Sydney Powell. Uh, the Kraken was brought against her today in Georgia. Your former prosecutor. What is your um, analysis um, of the fact that she pled guilty um, uh, as part of this RICO statute. Um, uh, Does that signal to you that she's going to be participating, testifying against the former president? Does it change your view of that RICO case at all? what's What's your sense of that? Well, my immediate assessment is that she didn't want to go to jail. Uh, and that ultimately was the driving force. Um, she ended up pleading guilty to uh, lesser offenses, sub, uh, I don't five or six misdemeanors. And it appears as if the sentencing recommendation will be probation. So she will avoid jail. But my understanding is that she's also required to testify truthfully in any future proceedings, which means that uh, she will have to testify uh, against Donald Trump. And what I think really jumps out uh, and it should be on everybody's mind is you can we can talk about the merits of a case or the political ramifications of these cases. But if any of these people are charged uh, are convicted, rather, they will go to jail and they don't want to go to jail. And so um, you can be out there and Donald Trump can be out in the public claiming it's, uh, you know, a, a radical, whatever he says, you know, trying to politically get him and election interference, all these bogus arguments. But those arguments are not allowed in the courtroom. They will have nothing to do with the jury's decision on whether or not uh, he is guilty or not guilty. And the result of a guilty verdict is jail time. And I think Sidney Powell, as a lawyer and as a former prosecutor herself, understands that and got out quick, um, which is generally the smart thing to do. You want to be the first one in if you can. And that's exactly what Sidney Powell did. So it should be a signal to many of the other defendants in these cases um, of what's coming down the road. So Trump's going to have a busy court schedule next uh, next spring, uh, the presumptive Republican nominee. Well, I do you uh, where are you on the hope meter? As far as whether like there could be a legal resolution, I guess, to the Jack Smith case before, I don't know, the Republican convention, I don't know, next summer. Like, is that is that even feasible? And um, and if so, uh, 
you know, do, are you concerned at all about the argument that the, that that there is political reasons not to do that? Right. Like putting on your prosecutor hat. Right. That like that there's backlash that we you know, who knows? And obviously we've seen threats, domestic terror threats from Trump supporters. Um, yeah, look, my my prosecutor hat uh, would lead me to say that you should not consider any of that. Um, if we are to treat every uh, citizen equally under the law and the lie applies, law applies equally, then you have to follow the facts of the evidence and uh, make charge what you believe. You can prove beyond a reasonable doubt to 12 jurors of your peers. Um, you know, the political ramifications of it are obviously um, on on a lot of people's minds. And as a you know elected official, I, I think about that as well. But the reality is that um, Donald Trump is fomenting this violence and it would be completely perverse to say that because Donald Trump is acting so improperly, uh, perhaps even in some cases illegally, as to try to foment political violence because of these cases that we should therefore treat him differently and either drop the case or give him a plea offer, the generous plea offer, uh, would just incentivize this terrible, terrible behavior. And so I simply just, I I think that it cannot be a consideration of the prosecutors as they're moving forward. And it is incumbent upon, frankly, a lot of the Republicans in the House of Representatives who seem to be doing the bidding of Donald Trump throughout this term and as his taxpayer funded defense lawyers to call out Donald Trump's inappropriate, improper behavior that is causing violence around the country. Because he's not going to listen to me. He's not going to listen to you. Um, He may not listen to them, but the only ones that he will listen to are going to be his supporters. And they need to uh, find a spine and stand up to him because someone's going to get killed. You just gave me a new idea for the McHenry deal. Instead of D.C. statehood, maybe just a line item for funding Jack Smith. You know, just ensuring Jack, Jack Smith's funding for one more year. That, that's, that'd do it for me. That'd get me on board for McHenry. Just, just one idea. I'll, we'll keep, we'll keep bringing, we'll keep knocking that one around. Um, what, uh, you didn't add the first part. What would, is it even feasible that the, that J- the Jack Smith thing can be resolved oh. next year before the election? Look, I think that the, I think there's a good chance, though, by no means certain that the um, election interference, the election overturning case in D.C. Uh, will go to trial in March. Um, I worry a little bit that uh, there will be some appealable issue that Donald Trump will find that he can make what's called an interlocutory appeal, which means he can appeal it immediately to the appellate court, which would then delay that process. But even if that trial goes forward and he's convicted at the end of March, um, he won't get sentenced for a minimum of three months, perhaps longer. Uh, and then there's an appeal. And the question will be whether he is uh, on bail pending appeal, even if he is sentenced to jail. So there are a lot of uh, questions. Would he have and- the ankle bracelet in that case? What we, well, it depends we on what the judge does after conviction, mm-hmm. um, because often your bail conditions will change uh, at that point. But um, I don't know. We're that doing that- a little never, never Trump or porn today. Speaker Bacon, Trump, Trump in an ankle bracelet. I mean, it's po- you know, it's all po- they're making it possible for us to dream. You know, I wouldn't generally. Well, I'm not the type to generally dream about these sorts of things, but they're putting themselves in this situation with their let, behavior. If you are a never Trumper, Tim, yeah. I would suggest that you start dreaming about Donald Trump behind bars, okay. uh, because that will be a much more serious than an ankle bracelet. Yeah. We've got Vov actually. It's on. It's chilled. <laughs> um, it's chilled, and it's been waiting in there. Uh, uh, we st- we stopped opening up champagne bottles every time he was indicted after the after the second one because that's just st- starting to get expensive. <laughs> starting, <laughs> starting to get a little spendy, uh, popping a bottle every time. But uh, I'm, I'm I appreciate you you giving me a little bit a uh, little bit of hope on that. Um, okay, what well, one other thing? You've been a star of kind of the oversight uh, hearings. Uh, pushing back on these guys, I've asked. Uh, I'd all read and 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 some of your other colleagues on on this. Um, I 
I, I, I've you've been very strong on the Barisma thing. I, you know, I like just this whole notion that there was something, there's some problem there with Shokin and like that. You know, I wrote about this two years ago. Like that is all just nonsense. Like what Biden was doing with the Ukrainian prosecutor was counter the what Barisma's interests were. Okay, is there anything? Like, have you heard any in any of these hearings? Have you heard one thing that that gave you even a little bit of doubt that there might be something worth looking into here with regards to Hunter Biden and and the the financial issues? No, I, I really haven't, um, and that's why it's such a, a an abuse of power that they've moved forward with an impeachment inquiry based on um, fiction and what they are parroting. Uh, is just simply false information. It's lies. And what they are relying on is a complete misrepresentation of what the evidence actually shows. Um, and so, you know, as a former prosecutor who was trained to follow the evidence, um, and that's what we did in the first impeachment, um, we got that whistleblower complaint. Uh, we He released the transcript um, with President Zelensky, And we then pursued an investigation and we brought in 17 witnesses who had firsthand knowledge of matters involving Rudy Giuliani, Donald Trump and Ukraine. And they painted a picture um, that was not painted by the staff or the members. It was painted as it should always be by the witnesses and by the documents that we obtained. And that's how you do an investigation. What they have done here is they have jumped to conclusions and they are desperately scrambling to backfill in some evidence to support those conclusions. But it doesn't fit. And that's the reverse of how you do an investigation. And now they got stuck because, as we know, Kevin McCarthy was held hostage by the right and Donald Trump himself. And they wanted an impeachment inquiry as retribution for Trump's. So they were just going to go forward with it, even if the evidence does not support it. And there's just simply nothing in any of the bank records. There's nothing in any of the documents. Um, There's nothing in any of the witness testimony that not the witnesses they brought in in their first hearing who had no firsthand knowledge, but in witnesses they've had behind closed doors who did work with Hunter Biden. And to a T, everybody said Joe Biden had nothing to do with Hunter Biden's business. Uh, There was even a witness who came in who uh, was a bookkeeper for the president uh, previously, as well as Hunter Biden. And he said there was never any money that was transferred from any of Hunter Biden's business interests to Joe Biden. So the evidence is shows the opposite of what the Republicans are alleging. Um, And the problem is that in our media world right now, they can parrot that in friendly media outlets on the right that get to a particular uh, uh, leaning person who uh, would like to believe this. And it can infiltrate the the public body. And that is really upsetting because it is pure lies. Totally agree. You've done wonderful work on that committee. Really appreciate it. Okay, mm-hmm. we're out of time. I have, I have other rapid fire questions I usually use, but in 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 you know solidarity with our uh, Jewish friends this week, our final rapid fire question is this: I saw that you joined the Israeli professional basketball team recently, and so um, we like to do Mount Rushmores here. We're going to do Jewish athlete Mount Rushmore. Okay, we're gonna. I'm I'm I'm, right. I'm spotting you, Sandy Koufax. Yeah, I was going to okay. say Sandy Koufax, <laughs> um, Hank Greenberg. Ooh, that's a good Ooh, one. I got a good one for you. Uh, Rod Carew, I believe. He converted. converted. It's, it's in the song. It's in the Adam, it's it's exactly in the Adam, Adam Sandler, Sandler song. song. <laughs> um, God, now I really got to go back. Danny uh, at the on the Wizards, the guy on the Wizards. He's really good. Danny, we're going to have to look into him. Oh, yeah. an Israeli? On, yeah. On the, on the Washington Wizards, the Israeli guy. But if you have another one, you can go for it. Um, I'm I'm trying to think of like old school uh, Dolph Shays, maybe. Dolph? Denny Avdi, Avdija. Avdija. Denny. Okay. Israeli Serbian. I check him out. He like he All brings right. together Israeli and my Nikola Jokic love with the Israeli and Serbian <laughs> one body. Okay, we'll do more research. That was a good start. Rod Carew is a good choice. Dan Goldman, thank you so much. I'm so happy that you and your family is safe. You've taken your time for this. Uh, always welcome on the Bulwark stuff. Holler at us anytime. Thanks so much, Tim. It's great to be with you. Peace, man. See ya.